Hello, um, my name is Steve Ammerman, and this is the title of my talk today. Um, today's protests and America's racial history, listening to indigenous peoples. Um, today is, it's actually June 19th, wrong date, but there's my email address also. Um, uh, so today is Juneteenth, in fact, um, an appropriate day to um, talk about this subject, certainly. Um, in any case, the, the protests that have erupted after the police murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, have quickly become a nationwide and even global mass movement against the pervasive and persistent systemic racism that exists in our world today. This movement has got, grown to address not only the racism experienced by African Americans, but all peoples of color in our society including the first peoples of this continent, the indigenous peoples. It is they who are the focus of this video lecture today. But first, who am I and why listen to me? These are good questions. And one should always ask such questions of any speaker or writer or source. I may again, as the title page said, I'm a history professor at SCSU. Um, and history is something that always matters. That's not, not going to be surprising to hear from me, given that it's my chosen profession. But I feel I'm hearing protesters and the public in general saying that more than usual, and that they're realizing that history matters more than usual. I think I hear people, a lot of people saying that if we are to understand today's racism, and if we are to try to work towards ending it and transcending it, we really do need to have a better understanding of its roots, the roots of racism. And the roots are deep. This is where history, including history professors, might be able to be of at least some help. And that's why my colleague in our department here, Jason Smith, had the good idea of encouraging us to put together these talks. So please do try to take the time to watch his lecture and the lectures by my other colleagues in this series. So why listen to me talk about the history of this continent's indigenous peoples? I am not an, an indigenous person myself. I should be clear about that. I am just a white guy. I have tried to learn as much as I can in my years of studies, but I did not grow up indigenous. I don't know what it's like to totally be indigenous and I, I never fully will. So in fact, you really shouldn't listen to me, and I, I mean that. But to qualify it a little bit, um, you shouldn't listen to, to just me. As much as possible, you should listen to indigenous people themselves. You should listen to them explaining what their life is like today and the history that brought them to this point. In fact, I should probably note that my talk here is probably mostly aimed at a white and or non-indigenous audience. I think that most indigenous people would probably say that they already generally know their history without needing me to come along and explain it to them. In any case, one thing that I can try to do is to use my position, and it is indeed a position of privilege to be a college professor and a white college professor at that, to serve as someone who can try to maybe help connect non-Indigenous audiences to Indigenous voices. So with that in mind, I've put together a list of some ways in, in which you, and I for that matter, might seek out opportunities to listen to Native peoples. Um, and here's the list here. Um, I'm gonna post this somewhere for your use. Um, the list includes museums, gatherings such as the annual summer powwows held by the Mohegans and Pequots, films, websites, online native newspapers, social media pages, and finally, that old fashioned source that comes in the form of actual books. In each case, I've tried to list the sources that are created. I've tried to list, list sources that are created, controlled, directed, and authored by in, indigenous peoples themselves. One of the defining features of indigenous history and culture over the centuries is that white people have had the power to define and describe them. Whites have built and arranged the museums. Whites have made the films and TV shows. 
Whites have written the history books and the anthropological articles. Whites have done a lot of talking and not enough listening. Indigenous people have now made their own museums, developed their own films, created their own websites, and written their own books. We need to seek these out. But we just might not initially know of such sources or know how and where to find them. So I hope my list can serve as one useful starting point. And I hope to post it somewhere for your use, perhaps on the department's Facebook page or on its website or both. I'm also happy to email it to you directly if you wish. Of course, living in this time of COVID, things like visiting indigenous museums or attending indigenous gatherings, such as powwows, are going to be difficult. But obviously we do still have the web and we do still have books with libraries perhaps beginning to open back up and of course delivery from online sellers still being possible. For the rest of this lecture, I'd like to use this particular book. Let me hold it up here. Um, you can see that. Now, the title, as you can see, is Dawnland Voices, an anthology of indigenous writing from New England. And it was published fairly recently in 2014. The title is derived from the fact that in some cases, some indigenous peoples refer to this region called New England by the pilgrims as Dawnland, stemming, I think, from the idea that given their particular geographic lo location, they were among the first of the continent to greet the sun rising over the Atlantic Ocean for each new day, hence Dawnland. For one thing, the size of the book should help give us a sense for the abundance and richness of native ideas, statements, and thoughts. And these span, uh, you know, several centuries of writings by native people, though with the more of an emphasis, I suppose, on, on contemporary writings in the 20th and 21st century. But they do stem back to the 1600s and 1700s. In any case, um, the title of the book is not Dawnland Voice. Um, it is Dawnland Voices, plural. Between its covers, it contains the writings of some 60 or so native people, representing 10 of the distinct native nations of the New England region. And of course, this is just New England. If we consider the entire continent, from Connecticut to California, from Alaska to Mexico, we would be dealing with many more nations, at least 500 or so, and many more voices and spread across some 12,000 years of history, at least. I obviously cannot read all 690 pages of this book to you right now, um, so I'll just read one of the voices. That way, in a certain sense, we can try to make this, a, uh, this teach-in a chance to listen to a lecture from an indigenous person rather than a lecture from just me. It was very hard to choose just one to read from, but I've chosen one that might be particularly helpful, I think, and relevant in this current moment. It's the text of a speech that an, indig that an indigenous person gave 50 years ago in 1970 by a man named Frank James, also known by the name Wamzada. 1970, in fact, was a time similar in some ways to today, in that native peoples, along with African-Americans and others, were amplifying and accelerating their demands that past and present injustices be dealt with. Indeed, one of the main Native activist organizations, the American Indian Movement, had been formed in 1968 as a protest against police brutality directed at Native peoples in the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. The same city, of course, where the police murdered George Floyd last month. And some members of the American Indian Movement were actually on hand for Wamzada's speech in Massachusetts that day. Wamzada was a member of the Aquita Wampanoag Nation, located to our east in the present day state of Massachusetts. His ancestors were the ones who first encountered the English pilgrims who landed on their shores in 1620, just one year after other Englishmen brought the first African slaves to the Virginia colony to the south. Wamzada was born in 1923 and died in 2001. In 1970, the book editor tells us, 
Pilgrim descendants had invited him to appear at the 350th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower, but they uninvited him when they heard what he was planning to say. James went ahead and made his speech anyway before hundreds of Native American protesters, kicking off the annual National Day of Mourning. The United American Indians of New England continue each year to stage this powerful counter-representation to a remarkably enduring myth of Native Americans in New England. Um, I have a been able to find one uh, picture of him here, um, printed it off the web, and there he is standing next to the statue of the Wampanoag leader at the time, Massasoit, um, at least as the statue depicts him. So, here is the speech. I make no claim that hearing me read it from my basement on a video screen is in any way like hearing him give the speech in person on Thanksgiving in Plymouth um, that day in 1970, but it may at least start to give us a sense of listening. And uh, one added note. Language and words obviously have important histories and complexities. Indigenous people continue to discuss and sometimes differ about which word they feel is best when trying to describe themselves as a collective. Some still use the term Indian, even though it was obviously a misnomer created by a lost Columbus. In 1970, some indigenous people may have used the term Indian a bit more than today. At least you'll notice Wamzutta using it frequently, frequently, so I wanted to put that in context. Here then is some of what Wamzutta had to say on that day. I speak to you as a man, a Wampanoag man, I am a proud man, proud of my ancestry, my accomplishments won by a strict parental direction. You must succeed. Your face is a different color in this small Cape Cod community. I am a product of poverty and discrimination, two social and economic diseases. I and my brothers and sisters have painfully overcome and to some extent we have earned the respect of our community. We are Indians first, but we are termed good citizens. It is with mixed emotion that I stand here to share my thoughts. This is a time of celebration for you, celebrating an anniversary of a beginning for the white man in America, a time of looking back, of reflection. It is with a, it is with a heavy heart that I look back upon what happened to my people. Even before the pilgrims landed, it was a common practice for explorers to capture Indians, take them back to Europe, and sell them as slaves for 220 shillings apiece. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores of Cape Cod for four days before they had robbed the graves of my ancestors and stolen their corn and beans. One pilgrim source describes a searching party of 16 men. It goes on to say that this party took as much of the Indians' winter provisions as they were able to carry. Massasoit, the great sachem of the Wampanoag, knew these facts, yet he and his people welcomed and befriended the settlers of the Plymouth Plantation. Perhaps he did this because his tribe had been depleted by an epidemic, or his knowledge of the harsh oncoming winter was the reason for his peaceful acceptance of these acts. This action by Massasoit was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoags, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. What happened in those short 50 years? What has happened in the last 300 years? History gives us facts, and there were atrocities. There were broken promises, and most of these centered around land ownership. Among ourselves, we understood that there were boundaries, but never before had we had to deal with fences and stone walls. But the white man had a need to prove his worth by the amount of land that he owned. Only 10 years later, when the Puritans came, they treated the Wampanoags with even less kindness in converting the souls of the so-called savages. Although the Puritans were harsh to members of their own society, the Indian was pressed between stone slabs and hanged as quickly as any other witch. And so, down through the years, there's record after record of Indian lands taken and then reservations set up for him upon which to live. The Indian, having been stripped of his power, 
could only stand by and watch while the white man took his land and used it for his personal gain. History wants us to believe that the Indian was a savage, illiterate, uncivilized animal. A history that was written by an organized, disciplined people to expose us as an unorganized and undisciplined entity. Two distinctly different cultures met. One thought they must control life. The other believed life was to be enjoyed because nature decreed it. Let us remember, Indians are and were just as human as the white man. Indian people feel pain, get hurt, suffer from loneliness, need to cry as well as laugh. They too are often misunderstood. High on a hill overlooking the famed Plymouth Rock stands the statue of our great sachem, Massasoit. Massasoit has stood there many years in silence. We, the descendants of this great sachem, have been a silent people. The necessity of making a living in this mater materialistic society of the white man caused us to be silent. Today, I and many of my people are choosing to face the truth. We are Indians. Although time has drained our culture and our language is almost extinct, we, the Wampanoags, still walk the lands of Massachusetts. Our lands were invaded. We fought as hard to keep our land as you, the whites, did to take our land away from us. We were conquered. We became the American prisoners of war in many cases and wards of the United States government until only recently. Our spirits refuse to die. We are uniting. We're standing not in our wigwams, but your concrete tent. We stand tall and proud, and before too many moons pass, we will right the wrongs we have allowed to happen to us. We have allowed the white man to keep us on our knees. What has happened cannot be changed, but today we must work towards a more humane America, a more Indian America, where men and nature once again are important, where the Indian values of honor, truth, and brotherhood prevail. You, the white man, are celebrating an anniversary. We, the Wampanoags, will help you celebrate in the concept of a beginning. Now, 350 years later, it is a beginning of a new determination for the original American, the American Indian. We're being heard. We are now being listened to. We are determined, and our presence here this evening is living testimony that this is only the beginning of the American Indian particularly the Wampanoag, to regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours. And that was the end of his speech. By the way, I wasn't actually able to quite read you the entire speech. In the interest of time, I did have to jump over certain parts. So if you're interested in reading the full version, and I encourage you to do so, you can, you can get um, the book, of course, Dawnland Voices, or you know, certainly much easier, um, you can look it up on the web. I've also put the link um, on the, the list that I've made to go along with this too. In any case, let me just quickly highlight um, two things um, that stand out to me at least um, from this speech, given where we are at right now today. First, you might've heard Wamzetta mention that the pilgrims arrived just after an earlier group of Europeans had brought disease to their shores, causing an epidemic. In current times, we can get a little closer to imagining what that must have been like, but only a little. One scholar estimates that the, that the disease, and we're not sure if it was smallpox or measles, um, at least I don't know that scholars have determined that or that the Wampanoags know, um, but I could be wrong. Um, one scholar estimates that the disease to which the Wampanoags had no immunity may have caused the deaths of 90% of their population. The suffering from COVID today is great and tragic, but a 90% die-off is impossible to fathom. Second, at one point, Wamzada notes, we, the Wampanoags, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. I think that Wamzada is trying uh, to help us see that whereas for white Americans, Plymouth Rock is seen as the start of greater and ever increasing freedoms, for indigenous peoples, it is quite the opposite. It was the start 
of ever decreasing freedoms. America's constant and never ending struggle is to strive to make its claims of freedom and equality actually apply to all people. A few pages later in the book, um, there is the text of a speech um, given by a woman named Paula Peters, who is also Wampanoag, um, Mashpee Wampanoag. And she gave the speech in 2009, 11 years ago, and 39 years after Wamzada's speech. Like Wamzada, she was able, she was to give a speech to a group of descendants of the Mayflower. Unlike Wamzada, she was allowed to speak. In fact, she began by quoting from Wamzada's banned speech of 1970, and she hit many of the same themes that he did. Interestingly, the Mayflower descendants, descendants ended up giving her a standing ovation after the speech. It was, perhaps, a sign that at least some of Wamzada's hopes of being heard, of being listened to, were being realized. Some whites were finally doing some more listening. But of course, many were still, still not listening then, and many still are not listening today. Time and again, it seems indigenous people across the country, and perhaps in New England especially, have to repeatedly tell whites even this basic fact, that they are still here. And you heard Wamzada saying that in his speech too, that they are still here, that they still exist, that their cultures still exist, that they still walk these lands. Simple ignorance of this fact and active denial of this contributes mightily to their ongoing struggles for equity, respect, and justice. For example, um, we might think of how the US government has been slow to uphold its responsibilities in directing economic and medical assistance to Native peoples um, during this current pandemic. We might also think about how um, too many whites still feel that they can continue to appropriate Native images and cultures to sell products or promote sports team mascots, thus further perpetuating harmful stereotypes and ignorance. And we might also think about how um, the Trump administration recently, and in the midst of the pandemic, no less, sought to dissolve the existing Mashpee Wampanoag Reservation. Indeed, they are seeking to take yet more land away from the people who actually helped the pilgrims all those centuries ago. Let us hope that 2020 might be a moment and a movement where more whites finally do better fulfill Wamzada's hopes of 50 years ago to listen to the first peoples of this land. Let us all seek out those opportunities to listen. If we can do that more, if we can listen more and better to indigenous people, to African-American people, to all peoples of color, and all those who have been marginalized in our society, perhaps by November, November of 2020, when we commemorate the 400th anniversary of when Wamzada's ancestors saw strange ships headed to their shores, Perhaps we will have made better progress towards the goal of creating the more humane America of which Wamzada spoke. It will not mean that that work will somehow be done by November. It will never be done. But it might mark some progress forwards, even if small. That, at least, would be something to start really be thankful for. Thank you again to Professor Smith for encouraging our history department to share some thoughts on the current state of affairs at this time with these videos. Thank you very much for listening to this video. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send me an email at ammermans one at southernct.edu. Thank you, stay safe and stay well. Bye for now.